This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Neil Malarkey, and we talk about improv and business, listening with intent, and why everyone is creative. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Neil Malarkey. Neil Malarkey is a comedian who uses his improv skills to inspire business people to embrace their creativity and enhance their communication skills. 32 years ago, Neil co-founded the world-famous improvisation group The Comedy Store Players with Mike Myers. And chances are you'll have seen Neil perform on TV shows including Have I Got News For You, Whose Line Is Anyway, QI, or the Austin Powers movies. Today, however, you're more likely to find him working with a string of prestigious clients including Unilever, Deloitte, Microsoft, or advertising giant WPP. He's become synonymous with bringing the agility and innovation of improvisation into the boardrooms and sales teams of some of the world's biggest organizations. My great pleasure to have Neil with us today. So welcome, Neil. Hello. Thank you for having me. So share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Well, last night I was at the Comedy Store doing the Comedy Store Players show, which is a bit like Whose Line Is It Anyway, if people have never seen the players, or if you've never seen Whose Line Is It Anyway, it's a type of theatre where the audience suggests things to the actors and they improvise scenes there and then, immediately. Uh, This week I'll be training some people in the public sector who have to take up leadership positions, and I'm helping them with some improv skills The main skill of improv is listening and being comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. And then we'll actually look at some scenarios as to what they might have to face in the future where they can't tell people what to do, but they've kind of got to get buy in from different organizations and different individuals. And I sense that you're looking at your CV, your background, you are not the kind of person that likes being put in boxes. You, <laughs> you have, you have this uh, multifaceted. You could even say Renaissance man uh, style uh, thing. I uh, think about you as well. Um, so, talk to. I mean, how did the, the the initial kind of comedy part begin? Where, where did you learn your craft initially in comedy? Well, I was a teenager growing up during the period when Monty Python and the Goodies were exciting for teenage boys. And I I could see how comedy was something that was powerful. You could get people to listen to you and you get groups to kind of work together, if you like. I mean, it sounds quite grand for a 14-year-old, but it was just kind of, oh, comedy, that's a great thing. And in my house, I am the third of three boys. My eldest brother was the funny one. He's an accountant now. And gradually, I sort of was able to do things at school. For example, I was in the school play and I loved that. I loved acting and I loved being directed I love rehearsal and then of course when it got to the actual show I was a bit naughty doing cheeky things which I'm sure my fellow actors didn't like but I got that taste for improv I suppose and then I went to Cambridge University and there's a group called the Cambridge Footlights that people may have heard of because of Hugh Laurie, Stephen Fry, Emma Thompson, Mitchell and Webb, Jan Ravens and it was a sketch group really and you got to see and i saw hugh laurie and Stephen fry emma thompson tony slattery paul shearer writing and acting sketches and i thought that's what i want to do and i got to be the president of footlights and we we toured around the uk then australia i got my equity card and then we couldn't call ourselves footlights anymore after the year was up and we found ourselves in a small pub theater in notting hill and there was a guy who'd seen our poster saying ex cambridge footlights And he was selling tickets for us. And he'd come from Canada. And his name was Mike Myers. So he'd heard of Monty Python. and I'd heard of Second City, an improv Mm. troupe. Actually, mostly do sketches, but they also do improvise as well. And that's how often they develop their new sketches by improvising after the main show. And I knew of Second City. Not people, not many people knew about this. It's this place in Chicago. And lots of people come from Second City to Saturday Night Live and the Blues Brothers, which I loved. I particularly had an interest in American comedy. And he said, well, it's it's come from this thing called improv, which started in the 1920s. It was actually a social worker helping children become more articulate, giving them confidence to speak up. But it was her son who used these exercises as a form of theater in themselves. 
And I was so excited. And Mike and I, with Kit Hollerback and Dave Cohn and Paul Merton, created the Comedy Store Players, October 27th, 1985. And not many people understood that you could do a show that was made up. And Mike had done it in Canada. Kit had done it in San Francisco. And we were their friends. They said to come along and they taught us some of these exercises. But mostly Kit and Mike carried it for a while. Eventually, Mike went back to Canada. We had to sort of step up. And it's been my bread and butter and my comedy home for the last 30, nearly 32 years. So um, it was answering all my questions artistically. I did write and perform sketches. I was on Have I Got News, QI, the news quiz, quote unquote, those things that most comedians who want to get on will appear on. And I co-wrote a sitcom with Tony Hawks called Morris Miner's Marvelous Motors. <laughs> And we thought this would be late night Channel 4. And the producer and executive said, no, this could work really well. Tea time on a Saturday. There are many comedy shows that go at tea time on a Saturday. They're not scripted. You know, they tend to be Noel Edmonds type thing or whatever. And it was it was quite a hard sell in the end. But we we were got great reviews from City Limits, which is a kind of left wing or was a left wing listings magazine in London and the Daily Telegraph. Uh, not a left-wing magazine. So uh, that was kind of bruising in a way because we got not great reviews and people didn't know quite how to place it. And I gradually started thinking about what else to do with my life. And I'd always liked how people, looking at how people react to each other. My degree is in economics and social science, social psychology, sociology. So I've always been interested in how people are. And I loved a man called Desmond Morris, who mm. who did a thing called man watching in body language. I found that interesting. And then how do groups work and, and who becomes the boss and power plays and stuff like that, I found interesting. And on the other hand, my dad was a businessman and he took none of it very seriously. He would come home and say how pompous hit his bosses had been and so on and so forth. So it was always kind of with a comedy tinge, but I was intrigued by it. So uh, I got to this point where I thought, do I want to be a comedian full time? And I thought, no, actually, I want to do something uh, different with my brain. I, I don't want to give up the comedy store players because I love that. And it's really much more fun than a lot of telly where you have to jump through hoops or you might try and get something commissioned and you do a pilot and it's kind of watered down. And then the executives say, no, we don't like it. And they may well be right. And oh, we've got something a bit like it already. So it's quite a long, drawn out process. I kept in touch with Mike, so I was in a couple of his Austin Powers films. Again, that's an exciting world, but you can spend a long time waiting for your movie to get funded, and it may or may not get made, it may or may not get distributed. These are great barriers to the creative process. On the other hand, with improv, it's there, it's, it's immediate. And I found there was an appetite for my approach to creativity, specifically through improv, in the world of large and small organizations, public sector and private sector, they kind of got excited by this thing that you could easily transfer these skills that worked on the stage to day-to-day -day conversations, to, if you like, brainstorming techniques as well. But that thing where, can we make this work? And improv says, we can make it work. We've got nothing and we'll try and use what is given to us. And that metaphor really works well with people because it says, don't try and wait for the best idea. It says, go with the idea you have or go with the journey and it'll start telling you what the best step to take is next. And it's the a first few moments might be a bit clumsy. You might lead to something that isn't that fruitful. So you have to go somewhere else. You have to get rid of an idea, but you kind of hold it lightly. You don't go, oh, no. It's not working the first minute you go, actually, that we're still creating the seeds that we'll be able to harvest later. And when you're working with those organizations, you know, one of the first skills you teach them of improv, and they can also relate to their own businesses, is this, this skill of, of active listening. So, talk, you know, so we think, you know, OK, we should be listening to other people as part of a team. But but how is the kind of way that you listen as a uh, when you're doing improv different from the way that you're listening most of the time? Well, people talk about active listening, and there are lots of definitions of that, which one is I'm just listening to you and I'm really focused on you. One is I actually repeat everything you say. Improv is we treat what the other person says as an offer. 
And I call it listening with intent. I'm intending to use what you've given me, even if I may disagree or take it in a different direction. It's very easy for two people to run in parallel, which is I'm saying my thing, you're saying your thing. And the great screenwriter, Russell T. Davis, he said he had a breakthrough when somebody said, uh, you know, don't write dialogue, just write two people having a concurrent monologue, (laughs) which is I'm saying my thing, you're saying your thing, and we don't really coincide whereas improv says okay whatever you say is is really useful to me i'm going to use something you say i'm going to have a yes and mentality now the danger is people think this all sounds a bit fluffy and a bit uh team buildy hr stuff rather than the real nitty-gritty is your idea is going to be really improved if i can add something to it and get involved rather than step back and say can I tell you why that isn't a good idea? I'm wondering, and, I'm, I'm wondering when you've gone in, in, into those different organizations, uh, have there been occasions where, you know, that th- you talk about that, that, that twin track that's, that's almost happening when people aren't really, they're not really having a conversation with each other. They're just kind of got two separate monologues. Um, when, have you ever gone into organizations where maybe there's been quite strong silos where maybe yes. people <laughs> aren't speaking? To, so they're kind of good. Those two separate monologues are going together. But no one's really listening. There's no and <laughs> going there. So it's very much so. And this is what I'm often brought in because it's not only this function isn't talking to that function. It's people within this function and not talking to each other. You will find there'll be people who are breaking those silos, if you like, and they will chat as, as, as people do in real life, which is I take on board your idea. We argue. I can respect your point of view. You might even change my mind. But these differences can become pretty vast if people do get stuck in their ways. And so, yes, you do try and break down these silos. I can do it through comedy by saying, look at marketing. Aren't they all idiots? Oh, sales, they're all nasty people. And I say, ha- and, and you can sort of ch- chivvy people along by teasing out these differences that they realize make their tribes somehow feel comforted, but actually it's not helping the organization. Uh, so, yeah, there are silos uh, hugely in many organizations. The bigger the company, the easier it is to make that silo thinking h- hard to get out of. So, I will try and ask, get people to think about what is the offer? What is the offer that I'm hearing from this person? The idea of an offer and a block. So if I say to you in a a sketch, an improvised scene, good morning, doctor, you might take on board doctor. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Johnson. I see your leg is better. So you've taken doctor and I've accepted patient. And I say, oh, yeah, my leg is better. I'm playing football. So I've taken leg and I've given you football. You go, yeah, football. I heard you scored three goals at the weekend. So you kind of we build one step at a time. So it's you give, I give, we give. We even call one of our games, which is our ethos, which is follow the follower. Um, Now, if I go to you in a scene, good morning, doctor, and you say I'm not a doctor. We call that a block. And there are many more subtle ways of blocking in organizations. Mm. And we might say things like "Mm, building on that or I hear what you say and or things, we've tried that last year, or we can't afford it, I can't see that working, or my boss will never go for that. All of which may be true, and you may be able to find it hard to overcome them. But it's the little wins you can get every day that probably create the creative atmosphere for the bigger ideas to come through. Those techniques that you're you're using, um, obviously you're using them at stages where maybe there's an organization that there is some conflict, and you're looking in terms of improving communication. What about using those same kind of improv skills as it relates to kind of innovation and creativity within organizations. So often you think of maybe, um, uh, I was listening to someone the other day talking about the, the the American version of the office and they were talking about, they have a uh, two week period right at the start, which is very much kind of blue sky thinking, just pure. It's very improv based. And then they start, they they kind of move into a different thing there. If if you're brought on board um, by an organization who says we want to, to use some of these skills to help us, the improv skills to help us think in different ways, to think more creatively, to think more in an agile, innovative way. How, how, did, how does that work or how can you use those skills there? Well, it's interesting you mentioned agile because that's similar. They have a two-week period where they software, they meet each morning for 15 minutes, standing up saying, well, this is the idea I've got. People say, this is the idea I had. Let's go work on that. And if somebody said, I couldn't get this to work, you either put it in the backlog, which means you come back to it later, or uh, you, you go with, with that idea. But it, it, improv is about 
okay, I don't know where the idea came from. I, I don't judge it straight away. So I get people to play some of these simple improv exercises. So the yes and, uh, we tell a story one word at a time, and then we work out that I thought I was heading to the airport, you thought you were heading to the train station. Okay, well, in some ways, there may be there's a train station at the airport. <laughs> so you try and get people to think, how can my idea work with yours? And you try to get people to think, it's okay if my idea doesn't fly straight away. And uh, a great thing from Silicon Valley is the hippo, which is the highest income person's opinion. If it's that person's opinion that rules the day, it's not going to be a creative environment. Yeah. So if it's the new person, the young person, the unexpected person who's got an idea, you encourage that rather than unconsciously creating the idea the boss is the one who knows everything because she doesn't and he may not feel that that pressure is justified. So you get them to play some improv games and then we play some specific exercises, which would be what's the worst idea? Uh, what if we weren't? a food company, but we were a car company. What would it look like? What if we weren't all accountants? We were children. What would we say? So you try and get people to, to disrupt their own points of view that may have made it hard for them to think about it other than in the day to day. What about in the way though of, of so when you're in that stage and you're, 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 you're still at that stage, you're still trying, trying new things and being very open when it comes to I imagine the next stage in the process of you have all these things then it's then saying, okay, now I want to say, which, which of these do we want to pursue? Uh, you know, if I think my, my time working in Silicon Valley, there, there was a lot of, they were very much talked about in terms of how to give feedback, especially in, yes. in creative organizations. So as to, in order to not like crush something, you know, the stage you give your feedback, the way in which you give feedback as well. So when you're working in a, in a group context, whether it's an improvisation group and you're you're working up material for something or you're in an organization, what is the best way that people in the organization can think about in terms of giving that next stage, giving feedback and then starting to kind of drill down on which which ones do you want to pursue? Well, there's a few things to say there. Um, John Cleese did a, did a great lecture on creativity. I think it's from the 1990s. It's, it's on YouTube. But he talked about the closed mode and the open mode. And he talked about creativity being the open mode. But sometimes you might want to get to the closed mode, which is you've got the idea or some ideas. Now's the time to get implementing them. So you, you've got past your two-week laboratory period. Let's go on and try and make this work. Now, uh, some people will feel happier in that period because it's not blue sky thinking. It's actually tangible. Let's get on and do it. And so that might fit some people. And the worst situation is where somebody's still blue sky thinking on the day before you've got to deliver or somebody on day one of blue sky, let's see what happens, is already thinking about budgets and numbers. So you try and get people to be in the same place at least. Uh, but in terms of giving feedback, we try to say yes and even if I – have to disagree or take in a different way. Yes, but feels tougher. But yes, but and I often we, the advanced session is what are the ways we can make yes, but positive. Uh, I can say yes, but you're an idiot. Yes, but I don't like you. Yes, but we can't afford it. Yes, but it'll never work. <laughs> and that's not going to help. And I'm sure your Silicon Valley feedback ethos was how can I enhance the idea? How can I critique the idea? without upsetting the person who I am talking to or whose idea it may be. So we try and separate the idea from the person. Hard to do that sometimes. Uh, and you just have to sit with that uncertainty and that ambiguity, which is actually, is this a critique of the person or the idea? Or is this, is this idea being killed by this critique? And my friends at Ashridge Halt Business School, they would say, they say things like, in a group, you want to have minimal structure, maximum autonomy. So you want to have a bit of structure, but actually they can run it themselves. It's their own project. They say, say yes to the mess, because sometimes the idea will be a bit fuzzy or it won't get very clear to begin with on day one or day three, maybe on, if you're on a two-week thing. And, they, and they, uh, they always try and work out that a social creativity is, is, you know, you can get a great deal from a group rather than an individual, although, again, Susan Kane, who wrote a book called Quiet, said there are some things that the introvert uh, needs to have time. You, some creativity requires an individual to be on her own, his own. 
And some people don't like this, everyone having a, t- a chance to talk environment. But my friends at Ashford, they talk about the person who's resisting the idea or resisting the change. Don't block her out. Don't say, oh, that's what he's always going to do. He's just a curmudgeon. How can we get her involved? Because her different idea, his resistance is itself an offer because that could be a really great way of making the change, the project, the idea more robust it's if a, somebody does come in. It's a little bit almost like, you know, Edward, someone like Edward de Bono would talk about the different colored hats. So they would give black hats and they would different um, ways of thinking. Yes, approaching exactly. Problem. That's what I, I was skirting around it in a way is that uh, the black hat is, you know, let's see what's wrong with it. The green hat is let's go with whatever. And the worst thing is if we're wearing different color hats. That's why it's such a good metaphor that which is the people who are worried about the reality, it's okay, we'll just play with lots of ideas. And Linus Pauling said the, great, the good way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas and get rid of the bad ones. Mm. Now, of course, we don't always know what the bad ones are. but It's like, the, it's um, like, it's like that quote in advertising, 50% of the money we spend on advertising is wasted. We just don't know which 50%. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes the worst ideas are the ones that win. You know, mm. Mentioning Austin Powers, like all Hollywood movies, they tested it out. And it got terrible reviews from the trial audiences. Now, they showed it in certain places in L.A. where some of these people had never heard of James Bond or carry on films. So possibly they didn't know this, if you like, the source material. But the head of the studio just said, look, I like it. (laughs) I think it's good. We'll go for it. And it was also one of the ones that's kind of slower, a slow burner. And it it did really, really well on DVD sales, etc. Remember, do you remember DVDs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Anyway. Yeah, the the, the old blockbusters and and (laughs) things of of, of, of that. So I'm interested when you're going into these, you know, often big organizations and you might you might have 50 or 100 or more than hundreds of people there as well. If, if, if we do the, the, the rough numbers of it, I know like Adobe Corporation and I think it was uh, PwC did studies on how many people uh, globally consider themselves creative. And I think it's around, depends on where you are in the world, but it goes as low as like 39% in Asia, goes up to about 54, 55% in, in North America. So when you're going into those many of those organizations, h- half of the people in that room maybe do not consider themselves creative, not consider themselves the stuff to be coming up with with ideas. How do you win those people over to, to actually realizing that they have this innate creativity, this this ability to be agile? Well, that's a very good point. And I'm amazed that as many as 54, even 39 percent would consider the sample because in my sort of small samples, people consider they're not or they, they wouldn't say it, mm. you know, in front of others. They think creative is I'm creative because I'm in showbiz, but uh, oh, I'm just an accountant or I'm, I'm in compliance, whatever. And, and a lot of my joy comes from pe- people in what's called the back office, if you like, support, showing them they can be creative. And you do, I do start off with a very simple exercise to show them that, that they can be creative. And that actually the joy of improv is how we work together, which is I don't have to have all the ideas. Together we'll share ideas and together we'll create something over and above my creativity, your creativity. So there are simple exercises. One is just I get them to shut their eyes and imagine walking down a road uh, for a few minutes and tell me what happened. And then they find uh, something, a little gift inside a building. What is the gift? And they come up with it. And I say, that's creativity. You've Mm. thought of something. You've imagined something. You've partially remembered something and you've added something. That's what creativity often is, a mixture of making it up, remembering and my favorite definition of creativity is by a man called Paul Plesek, P-L-S-E-K, and his website is directedcreativity.com. I met him working in the health service, actually, and he said creativity is bringing together two hitherto unconnected concepts. So often it's just bringing this and that together. And I think that 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 way of defining creative, I think, is actually really important because, I mean, I, I speak all over the world about uh, creativity. And one thing I notice is that as I speak in different places, they have quite different conceptions as to what uh, creativity is. So here I am speaking just now. We're both in the United Kingdom. We come from uh, globally from this, this kind of in the UK from a tradition in the West, from a tradition of um uh, you know, the world was created in seven days, let's say. So this idea that something to be new it has to be created from nothing has said never existed before. When, you, <laughs> when I go and speak in Asia, because they come from a, a Confucius or a Buddhist background, they they think instead of um, this thing, I, I think it's the Latin creator ex materia, that something to oh, be created right. is an idea of two existing things that have come together to create something right. new. 
So yes. it's a fundamentally different way of thinking about creativity, this idea of cr- yes. something to be new, it has to be creative, it has to be brand new, never thought of, never existed, yes. big bang stuff, yes. to the idea that something to be created, you can take two different ideas. And I guess it's like one of the things that you have a, a similarity with the with the writer Scott Adams, who does the uh, Dilbert character, yeah. where he is a great uh, cartoonist, but also he'd, he's worked in back offices and businesses for years and years and years. And he knows of all those, <laughs> those experiences and organizations. And he basically married up those two things together to create something entirely new. Like you've created something entirely new with the, the work that you do as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think your, that definition you've just given there, I'll make sure we, we have that link uh, there to directed creativity as well, I think is, is, is perfect because it, it does it give us a more open way of thinking about you know creativity yes because creativity scares a lot of people i find british people a lot yeah. which is oh no it means i've got to be an artist i've got to be a writer i've got to come up with things on my own and often i say creativity can apply to the day-to-day the way you lay out the office the way you run your meetings it doesn't have to be massive and often when i ask them to do a creative exercise they're just remembering their journey to to, to work that morning or something. And I say, even that is creative. It doesn't have to be completely out of nowhere. Um, and a lot of things that we like are actually building on an existing idea. And there's even the concept called skeuomorphism, uh, which is on your computer, what is the icon for email? Well, it's an envelope. Yeah, it's a little, a little envelope, envelope thing. What's the envelope? What's the gra- graphic for a, an attachment? It's a paperclip. Mm. And for saving something, it's a floppy disk, which most people would have no idea about. <laughs> so there's very much an understanding of uh, can we understand the new in terms of the old? And some mm. of the uh, newest ideas are really old ideas rekindled in the light of new technology or new, new understanding. And I'm also fascinated that, that in Eastern philosophy there is the idea of ex materia in a way because a lot of improv can be likened to mindfulness in a way which Mm. is to be truly in the moment uh which truly in the moment with the other person or even with your own thoughts so you can apply improv techniques to solo creativity if you like which is allowing yourself to to wander and an idea to come to your head you don't know where it's come from but it's okay allow it and a lot of writers will say please don't ask me about my process because I don't know where my ideas came from. If, if I did, I, 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 they might not come anymore. And one of my fa- favorite books on creativity is actually recommended also by John Cleese is called hair brain tortoise mind hair as in like a rabbit, but the hair and the tortoise, that story, the hair brain and the tortoise mind by a man called Guy Claxton. The, that's with an X like Claxton but with a C, Guy Claxton. He's a professor of education here in the UK. And he says we kind of got two ways of thinking, which is, you know when you're in the shower or you're driving and you suddenly think of an idea or you remember a word you couldn't find or somebody's name comes to you that you couldn't recall when they were in front of you or you were trying to think of it. And he calls that the undermind. It's that wandering mind that doesn't even know what questions it's asking itself. As compared with the hair, which is fast problem solving can show it's working and our western society tends to privilege the hair which is you can only justify an idea if you can show how you got there or you can show you're working whereas the tortoise says look uh, and this is where a creative environment would say which is i don't know where this came from but can i just say this and improv allows you to say those things it's even i say sometimes it's kind of a structured a hair framework for some tortoise creativity so in the joyous moments of improv on stage and when you're running some workshops, people say stuff and they don't know where it came from. Mm. And it's a great idea. And we don't have to know where it came from. We can take it. And actually, one of the fascinating things, as the neuroscience is kind of backing into showing the reasons behind some of these things, I know there's, uh, I think at Harvard University, there's been some studies by um, one of the professors there on what's going on in, in the brain during someone doing improvisation, both uh, as, a, as a comedian, but also actually as jazz musicians as well. And yeah. also with well, they British do MRI films. scans. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. And one of the things that they find that's switched off is that that part of the brain, which is the 
maybe let's let's call it the slightly critical part, the bit that's the little voice that's saying, "Well, that's not good. That's not good." And it seems to be what jazz musicians are very good at doing, and also I believe comedians are very good at doing. It's basically switching that bit off uh, for a period of time. Yeah. Um, and actually, what you mentioned this this idea, the the the, the hearing and the tortoise. Uh, t- uh, t- is is a, is also similar to a lot of w- stuff that's coming out now. What's called default mode network. There's a writer called Srini Pile, who's come out yes. saying that there's uh, it's really kind of fascinating that this idea that we have to, I think, Junkley says open and close mode, but the way that neuroscientists would they would call it with this idea of focus and unfocused, and how yes. some of the most creative people are very very good at switching back and forth between those two things. Focus, obviously, writing your tasks, you know, doing all that stuff, but yeah. unfocus is the idea of daydreaming trying out ideas and things in your mind and yeah and then they're only they're only really just getting to the core of like well why why does that ha- why does that happen what's actually kind of going on there as well yeah well that's interesting i i found that on twitter the the, the, the other day default mode network and focus and, and and unfocus and uh the problem is that we all switch into unfocus uh, but often it's quite uncreative. Yeah. <laughs> and I say to any organization, any leader, there's lots of creativity going on here, but it's not necessarily helping your bottom line, if you like. People could be working out ways to get out of meetings or to slag off the boss when they can't be heard or stuff. And often people say, my best memory at work was not work, but it was when we were organizing our away day or when we did that charity day. We all went and built a shed. And I'm thinking, why can't we bring that to our every day somehow? Uh, it really uh, intrigues me that a lot of um, what we do in work is subsuming our creative selves to something else. And, and the best organizations allow both to to thrive. Um, this default mode network, I remember seeing, I think it was Horizon, which is a BBC documentary with some jazz musicians under an MRI scan. And it was there were seemed to be two parts of the brain which shut down when improvising, which was one, as you suggest, which is, what do people think of me? And the other one was, I know where this is coming from. Mm. Uh, and when we're improvising, we don't know where it's coming from. Uh, we just allow ourselves to uh, go with the process. And often people say to me after a show, oh, I like that bid when you did that. And I say, I've got what? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so we're often in flash drive rather than hard drive. And so you often... When I'm doing these more sort of applied creative improv moments, you need somebody who's not in the game to write stuff down. Uh, he or she is kind of is focused, if you like, and, and observing what's going on and just getting a sense of, aha, that's an idea. I'll take a note of that. And um, there's also a man called uh, Erwin Turbit, <laughs> very difficult to spell, who works with the idea of a man called Keith Grint who talked about problems in business, which can be tame or technical or wicked. Sometimes it's just tame, you know, change the timetable. Technical, which is, okay, let's change who reports to who. But sometimes the problem is wicked, which is if you try and solve it, you create other problems. And sometimes a leader's job, actually, is interesting, is like a dance floor. Is the leader on the dance floor or is is he or she watching from the balcony? And uh, sometimes with creativity, you need somebody to be on the balcony just to uh, kind of pick up the threads that are occurring. Uh, I I, I know know some roles as well in some organizations are almost kind of starting to split up what we currently think of of as a CEO role into into two functions, where there's the function of the existing organization that happens. And then yes. there's this other role uh, is in terms of, as you mentioned, kind of pulling pulling pieces, looking for new associations and looking for the new opportunities, especially, you know, I know for many of the organizations you work with, they're, they're in industries that are undergoing hyper growth because of automation and machine learning and AI and all these other things as well. So they're in a situation where they have all these these people, <laughs> their, yes. their, their, their resources um, but they they're using a fraction of the, of their capabilities and their capacities, and that new that uh, that new role that a lot of leaders are now starting to fulfil is saying, you know, my job is to like get the best from from these people and to pull these threads together, and actually to add it, you know, so it adds to the bottom line fund- fundamentally. Yeah. Well, also, what is leadership? Um, there's a good model by a man called Ralph Stacy from the University of Hertfordshire 
who's got a, a little quadrant. But it was in terms of ordinary management or leadership is just getting on with it, answering questions where the boss knows the answer, if you like, and he or she is getting things done. Extraordinary leadership is where the boss is the one asking the questions and saying, I don't know, and encouraging the team to create the answers or even the questions. And that's quite hard because that is creative and you could have some bad ideas or you could have no ideas and you're taking risks. And the dynamic of every day is uh, with these organizations and change that is happening, which is you've got to keep producing the widgets, but you've got to be thinking about two, three years ahead when those widgets won't be necessary or AI could be doing much more than they can, da- can do now. And when when I look at Davos and stuff like that, I've written a book on soft skills or we don't even know if we're going to call it soft skills or people skills, <laughs> but the skills that we required pretty soon are all about people. Yes, we'll need problem solvers, and that's about people. We'll need creative thinking, but we won't need a lot of the stuff that robots or computers will be able to do pretty soon. Even such things as being able to diagnose somebody who's got an illness, uh, do low-level accounting or legal stuff, or even fly an aeroplane. So the the future beckons for creativity, for people who, who can think, how can we use all these technical advances to actually create innovation rather than just nice Excel spreadsheets? And on that note, as we're talking about technology and AI, are there, are there any kind of online resources or tools or apps, uh, like things like Evernote or some other, other, other things that you, you like using and, and you find help you with, with the creative work that you do? Well, uh, Twitter, because there's always wonderful um, articles there. There isn't an app. And I'm, the challenge you've laid down to me there is, can we create an improv app? Can we have an app in your phone that says, I'm your fellow improviser, let's go for it? I'm sure there are, uh, and, and there should be. We, and, and that's kind of the a journey for, for many of us in learning and development now, which is how can we use this e-learning possibility we have to get people to use this every day mm. in their car, uh, heading home on their own or in smaller groups? And I have done a few videos where people do some of the exercises, and then I pop up again on video and say, how was it? Did you get X, Y, Z? But wouldn't it be great to get some sort of improv app <laughs> which encourages that creativity, that open-mindedness, that slightly silly, f- bizarre, open thinking that improv brings, but with a sense of structure? So a bit like a, like a headspace for improv then? Well, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, maybe that's it. Maybe headspace. Yeah, maybe that's it. But uh, uh, that's the technique for me because at the moment mm. I um, – uh, I get asked to go around the world and I do a workshop. People love it. And then, okay, I, I, I've, I'd love to create a follow-up that people can use as well as some sort of tool, I suppose, as well, where they can have an improv friend in their pocket. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll keep, uh, I'll put some of the, we're going to have the links here for some of the things you mentioned in the show, but I would love to know if you could recommend just one book to our listeners and one record, one album to our listeners, what would they be? Oh, wow. I wasn't warned about this. Um, one book which I'm enjoying at the moment, it's about a year or two old by Herminia Ibarra. <laughs> You'll never spell that. I can send you that by email. But her book is called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. So she's talking a lot about playing with who you are, playing with your role. People talk about being authentic. She says, what about being authentic to your future self? So if you are a leader, you've got to, you've got to change a little bit about who you are. Uh, you've got to start talking to people who aren't just the ones you work with, but ones in other organizations, perhaps. Uh, record. Mm, let's have a look. Now, I might have to go very old school here. I might have to go, <laughs> I might have to go with The Clash, first album. Uh, I'm just, I'm, next month, I'm going to go and see the Skids, who are from Dunfermline, I think, yeah. not far from where yeah, you are. Exactly. So uh, maybe I should mention them. Uh, but then, of course, you know, I love Public Image Limited. Um, and the moment I'm just listening in the car to there's a double album of Chic. It's called the Chic Organization. All the records played on and produced by Niall Rogers and Bernard Edwards, I think. So there you go. That's three. I, I, maybe I should come down for one. But, but, but what, I, what I find really fascinating is you mentioned, obviously, we started, uh, you know, the uh, the. 
um, the comedy um, store players, and and, the, and obviously, but, but just kind of before that was all the the punk, you know, nineteen seventy seven, and all the punk thing as well. And we're we're, we're now at a stage where some of those ideas that kind of came from that period because obviously comedy went big mainstream you know stadiums and and uh next week i'm, I'm going to be at uh, ricky gervais's show and you know i think he sold 2.5 million tickets for this current tour uh just now so it's kind of gone i mean and what i find fascinating is is how that has moved now into the organizations that you work with using some of those same skills that those those comedians are using up on stage but using it to to help improve their organizations Final question for you, Neil. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of the trade, all the skills and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but you know no one. No one knows you. You have to start again. What would you do? How would you restart? I would go to a local pub theater and say, is there a spare night you have? Tuesday night, can we just put on an improv show? It'd be fun. We don't have to charge the audience anything and we'll just take suggestions from the audience and create scenes and scenarios from that wonderful well neil thank you so much for coming on the show we're going to have all the links here in the show notes people just go to james me and just type in uh, neil malarkey you're going to get all the, the show notes here as well i wish you all the best with uh, all the, the the future shows you have coming up and all the organizations that you're going to be working with and i look forward to that new book that, that's coming out wherever you, you decide to call it in the end Thank you. And I'll I'll let you know when it's round. So thank you very much for this. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.